Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Today, as the affirmative team, we would be arguing as South Africa why we believe that it is extremely important for us to forcibly break down the explosive African hair enclaves. So, before I move on to my speech, let me first define or like let me set the context of what we mean by enclave in this speech or in, the, in this room, basically. So, for this pur the purpose of this debate, I think enclave would be any a portion of a land uh, here in South Africa. Uh, or a territory, land territory, basically surrounded by a larger territory, which is like the rest of South Africa. So basically you have the Dutch settlers, which is the Afrikaners, um, who lives in South Africa, and they are kind of um, excluded um, by culturally as well as ethnically, and they don't interact much with the majority of the South African population. This is how we understand the motion. And uh, so, uh, um, Afrikaners are basically people uh, who came from or who have Dutch ancestors, and they settled in South Africa a long time ago. So today, I'll be arguing um, three main points, sorry, four main points. First of all, I'll be arguing why enclaves, the basic idea of enclaves existing in South Africa goes against the basic idea of nationalism, why the South African nation came into place. I won't be taking this part. Uh, why South African nation came into place and why the idea of enclaves existing even today in South Africa goes against the very principle of why South Africa came into uh, existence in the first place. Secondly, I'll be talking about how to be advantageous if we forcibly break down these enclaves and make sure that the people, the Afrikaners inside the enclaves, interact and become well integrated with the large population. How will be advantageous to them in terms of educational opportunities? I'll also be touching upon uh, why this is better for their integration and their overall well-being, and how it would give them more voice. And my fifth argument, or let's say fourth argument, is how it would help in the overall cultural mixing. Uh, my partner here is also going to touch upon why we, we think force is required rather than a peaceful um, method of like uh, integrating if we want to basically uh, break down the enclave. Now I want to thank you. Uh, the political advantages of the system and how the, the people, the Afrikaners in the system would uh, find uh, a lot of economic advantages to the system as well. So on to my first point. Uh, so first of all, I think that enclaves goes against the basic idea of nationalism. Well, why? Because long time ago, before South African nationalism or South Africa as a nation came into place, a lot of people, like for example, there were white blacks and a lot of slavery and a lot of other cultures, etc., all living together. And then they all <coughs> instead of um, kicking out the British and the other cultures and making it like the original pure black nation, they decided to make sure that everyone's voice is heard and they came up with a compromise that is the constitution of South Africa and they made sure that the, all their voices are heard and they came up with this idea. So having an enclave in which the Dutch settlers, the Afrikaners live all by themselves makes them automatically a minority. I don't know about if they are a minority in numbers but I do think that they would be minority culturally and ethnically. They are cutting themselves out. And why do we think we need to break this down? Because we think that it would give them a lot of First of all, educational opportunities. Imagine you as a college student, if you're an Afrikaner and you're inside that enclave, you can't just go out and let's say, like say apply to the University of Cape Town because you are an Afrikaner, you're, you're, you're giving yourself that badge of like, hey, I'm different and I can't mix with you guys. Instead, if what we're proposing on our side is that if you break it down and make sure that they become a normal African citizen, then we are giving them more of a chance to be well integrated and increase your opportunities to have a voice as a normal citizen according to the constitution of South Africa. Yes, I'll take you now. Afrikaners are still citizens of South Africa. They decide to be in enclaves, and oftentimes they're very wealthy enclaves and they're people of privilege. So they think they'll have no problem getting into edu getting educational opportunities. Exactly. Thank you for giving me that point so that I can extend on it. What he said exactly was that uh, Afrikaners are wealthy, but they are still a minority, as in they are secluding themselves, they are making themselves special. They're like, we're in this special area, we're not like the rest of you guys, right? So I think if that, like, for example, I didn't know that they were wealthy, but if they are wealthy and they can integrate with the society better, that would be beneficial because they can start up new businesses and they can integrate more and they can grow as, I don't know, like a, a community and they can be well integrated into the society rather than just stay in a corner and be like, hey, this is our area and we're Dutch settlers. So I feel like this goes against the very idea of integrating and uh, making your voice heard, which is the very idea of nationalism and coming together and everything. <coughs> 
Secondly, we think uh, it gives them more voice, just like I said before. Um, if you are, uh, for example, today I think that they are a minority and in the constitution they might have special rights or whatnot, but if they become integrated and they become an armed citizen of South Africa, then they would, they, the, like, it would be easier for them to have their voices and concerns heard rather than just secluding themselves out and just leaving far apart and still be a South African citizen. Um, no, I'm not taking you. And, um, I think it will also help in cultural mixing because here in South Africa, like from my short experience right now, I can see that there's a lot of cultural mixing from the blacks and the people. And like, you know, like you guys don't uh, segregate between, one second, I'll take you, but yeah. So you don't, you don't segregate between, okay, I came from this culture, you came from this culture. It's all like we're all South Africans and we are all part of this. We're all citizens of this nation and you guys all live together. And just considering that they are, for example, the, 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 the basic reason why this topic came into being that Afrikaners are Dutch settlers or from Dutch settlers that in itself clarifies the fact that they see themselves as special or different and not belonging to South Africa rather than saying we are Africans. Yes, I'll take you now. Like the emotions of the Afrikaners are way stronger than that. They fear and hate the other people in the country. That's why they live in these empires. How do you expect them to deal with the backlash that they are um, inevitably have I mean, telling you that because if that is the case, if they hate the other Africans, then that is why we think we need to forcibly break it down. Because you can't have so much tension going on in the state and expect it to be peaceful for the long term. If they have a lot of hatred towards the other people of Africa and vice versa, then I think it's important that we do something either peacefully or forcibly. But we stand for the forcibly model because we think there's a lot of hatred going on and we think we need to break it down. So. So that they have more voice, they, they can better mix culturally, they can better integrate into the society, have their voices heard, can have better educational opportunities, more political voice, and have better economic advantages. So for all of these reasons, we're proud to propose that we should force a bigger African immigrants. Thank you. First of all, a clear depiction of what this policy looks like, because the POI that John was going to give and clarify at the beginning of the, of the Prime Minister's speech was, what does forcibly remove look like? What specifically does it look like for the South African government to come into these communities and tell these individuals to leave? Are you going to give them a 90-day or 120-day eviction notice and then send in troops or the police to forcibly remove those families out of them? Where are you going to put them after you remove them? Are you going to force them to move into other enclaves? Are you going to create mixed public housing so that you can magically integrate these communities so that they can hold hands and sing kumbaya? I need a clear depiction from the DPM or someone on the government bench as to what forcible removal looks like. Because as of, as of right now, they didn't really set any burdens for the debate. They just say, they're going to do it, it's going to be great, and we don't really know what it looks like. The second thing that we need to know is what happens afterwards, because they painted a very rosy picture of what this is going to look like. The fact of the matter is that, is that Afrikaners hold a substantial amount of political and economic capital in South Africa. That is to say that they do the vast majority of the investment. They hold a vast majority of property. That's why Cyril Ramaphosa proposed the land reforms and the tenure reform to stop the disproportionality in land, uh, in land that is held by white South Africans as opposed to black ones. They, they painted a rosy picture. We don't Think this is going to end up how they say. Before we move into how this is going to remote, it result in a massive amount of capital flight and boil down political tensions to the point where black South Africans, black South Africans and the majority of South African lives are going to be made a lot worse, we're going to propose an alternative. Because what we think the burden on the government bench was supposed to be was proposing this in order to make the lives of everyone better. There's a disproportionality in land that people hold and the capital that people possess. We think this was supposed to be very similar to the land reform debate. Our alternative is this. We would be happy to rapidly speed up and reform the tenure and redistribution process to spread the acquisition of land that was supposed to happen after the after, after the inauguration of Nelson Mandela. The land reforms have dramatically failed and there's too much land in the, in the hands of white South Africans despite the fact that they make up a minority of the population. We would speed up, we, we, we would assist the land port and redistribution, uh, redistribution committee that was created after the creation of South Africa and make sure they have the power to buy back the land at the market rates, which they currently don't have the power to do now because they don't have, because there's too many claims coming in. We would speed up that process to make sure people have jobs, make sure people have land so that they can farm, make sure people aren't in so much poverty. That's what we would do. We would not force anyone off their land in replacement, but that is mutually exclusive. We think that's a far better alternative if you want to actually stop people from being in poverty and help them. 
First of all, what is going to happen? What is the nature of the re removals going to look like? Africaners are probably not going to want to move off of their lands or off of these specific enclaves. And there's lots of reasons for that, right? There's economic reasons. They send their kids to school. They have probably businesses there. They probably have jobs in those communities. They're going to want to uproot from those communities and just move and try to find another job. It's not going to look very good for them. There's also lots of cultural reasons, right? People have ties to these lands, despite the fact that they are not black, 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 South, Af black South Africans. No, thank you. What they're going to do is they're going to fear a very slippery slope, right? If the South African government is willing to come in and push them out of their property, push them out of their apartments, or probably more likely their condos and their homes, what exactly else are they going to take? Are they going to willing to walk down the street and say, you're going to have to get out of the specific business that you own because we need to redistribute the land. We need to help everyone else in the community and help everyone economically integrate. What specifically is going is going to happen next? This isn't just a fairy tale here that, that is going to happen. Like This specifically happened in Zimbabwe when the Zimbabwe government in 2000 and 2001 did this exact same policy pri prior to going and pushing whites out, uh, pushing whites off of their lands and redistributing it violently and ineffectively to uh, 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 two blacks within Zimbabwe. So that means they're going to stay there and fight until the bloody end to defend their land or to defend the places where they built those individual communities. If you want a good example of this, another good example of this, look what happens when the Israeli government tried to push out, um, tried to push out Orthodox Jews out of the settlements in the West Bank when they evacuated the Strip in 2005 and 2006. It did not go well because people liked their homes, people want to stay there, and people built those business and built those businesses. What is the effect going to be? We think it's actually going to be pretty dramatic. The first thing, and I'll get opening government after this point here. The first thing it's going to do is dramatically heat up political tensions. We're coming into an interesting point in South African history, which is to say that after 25 to 30 years of, a, of, of apartheid, uh, uh, excuse me, 25 to 30 years after Nelson Mandela was elected, we're finally coming to a point where we can start to heal the pol political divisions after the Truth and Reconciliation Commi Commission. Commissions. We're addressing the major land and economic in inequities that happen in South Africa to try and come to a common place of understanding. You kill the political capital for that healing and mending to happen on two levels. One, you you incentivize white South Africans and Afrikaners to engage in like 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 horrible treatment against the communities around them. So when they say, oh, well, this is going to be good because we don't want them to stay in their own place and we want them to treat other people with respect and, and like integrate within society, I don't think that's what's going to happen because instead they're going to blame white, like, like South Africans and other people around them for forcing them off their lands. They're going to foment resentment against them. They're not going to like the government for pushing them off their lands, which means they're probably not going to treat the people around them who the government forced them to engage and integrate with very well, which means they're going to get a lot of violence and at least at the very like lowest level to the point where people's lives are made substantially worse to the point where this policy probably isn't even no. worth it. But second of all, on a political level, I'll get you just after this point, on a political level, you kill any political capital for things like land reform, which Cyril Ramaphosa wants to implement. The main worry in this in South, in South Africa among Afrikaners is that Cyril Ramaphosa is going to take people's property without any compensation, push them off their lands, and not give them anything in return. This is precisely how you feed into those, those very nativist and those very awful fears on, on, on account of the South African government to the point where the massive amount of people who own the massive amount of capital and land in that country are not going to support those reforms, which are incredibly necessary in order to give people back restitution for the property that was stolen from, stolen from them in 1913 and during apartheid. That's a bad thing. Opening. Are you suggesting that forceful land redistribution in order to cure poverty is so much better than making sure that they integrate in a, in, in a, a civilized way in terms of business and have capital distributed like that? Well, are, you, are you disregarding our model and telling that forceful land redistribution is going to make everyone happy? I'm a, a little bit confused as to like the premise of your POI here, but what we're saying is that there are land reforms that need to happen. The South African government, to some degree, is trying to pursue them, and to some degree, we think they are incredibly necessary. You kill the political capital in order for that to happen, because the massive amount of people that you need to support that policy are Afrikaners and are white South Africans. It's going to be a bad thing. Second thing that happens is capital flight, right? Recognize, again, that they make up a large amount of the economy <coughs> with a lot of investing, which means that they think their property is at risk in the future. They're going to pull out that capital, which means the economy experiences a huge downturn because all the money is leaving South Africa. Again, this happened in Israel and in and in Zimbabwe in 2001 when this happened. Second of all, you're going to get a lot of external backlash. Like Trump is already sending out tweets. I think you're out of time. I'm not quite sure. But, uh, Trump was already sending out a lot of tweets when the South African government proposed their land reform program and said that they were going to, quote, look into it. Right? They sanctioned the South African government and the Zimbabwe government back when they tried this uh, a, a long, long time ago. They're going to do it again if they think they're pushing white South Africans off the land. Like, we have a very racist president. He doesn't really care if he's going to hurt other individuals. We think he's willing to do the same things that he's threatening to do, just as the United States government has done before. Large-scale economic downturns in the economy and massive political tensions that hurt the individuals who you want to help the most is a bad reason to try and pursue this policy. We far prefer something a lot more reasonable, a lot more incremental. We are very proud to oppose.
Okay, so there are three things that we agree on on both sides. One, there is tension between the Afrikaners and the uh, citizens of, the, uh, of South Africa in general. Two, Afrikaners, uh, Afrikaners hold a huge political and economical power. And three, someone is gonna like immediately get hurt when we implement this change. So what, what team opposition came up with is if, if, if we divert this, if we, we, if we change the power distribution here, we are immediately going to hurt the, uh, the political and econo uh, economic power of the Afrikaners in South Africa. And that is, uh, and, and they have been working for, they have been building businesses in these areas. And it is not our right to, to shift it to other areas. And it is not our, our right to, to change these businesses. And what we think here on, uh, on site government is that, is that if we want to implement change, and if, uh, if we, if, if people did not initially choose to, to, like, to, sh to shift these powers, and because we are in this situation, there is no way to, uh, no way to encourage these people to, to move out of these places unless we force them. And that is why we think forcing is important, because if we just encourage them, if we just give them an incentive, as, as, the, as team opposition came up with, if we just get, if we just give plans to other people, that is not going to solve the issue. The issue here is that we are putting a huge <laughs> group of people in a certain area, and then we have basically two different countries and two two huge, diff, uh, like hugely different cultures in the same country. And when 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 they came up and said that. Africans are South African citizens, and like because they are South African citizens, it's not as, like it's not like we are differentiating and we we are discriminating. But but it is because they are South African citizens that we can make this change because we are they are all working for the benefit of this country and because. Uh, and if the benefit of this country for the people to integrate and for the people uh, to, for us to not discriminate between the uh, and like uh, redistribute the powers, uh, force is important. Yes. So why is this the most important issue you need to tackle in order to fix like relations in South Africa? Here, here. So we think it is the most important issue because because one we have people uh, people that are separated, people that are not getting the same treatment uh, in in either areas. And when when we say that they have a huge chunk of political and economic power, that that means we are not giving an equal representation for everyone in the country. And that is going to go into my first argument, which is how how implement uh, how forcing Africans to uh, to like to leave their enclaves is going to uh, improve the political, economical, and uh, and national and international relations of South Africa. So if uh, so, basically in countries. Uh, laws, uh, laws are, are, and like constitutions are made like after discussion between different parties in the country, right? So <coughs> it can be parliaments, it can be other uh, other forms of councils. But these have like different groups. Uh, they have to have equal representation of ethnic, racial, and religious groups. And we like we're saying that in this situation we may we might have all of that in numbers. Yes, we might have all of them in a council. But if all of them sit in the same room and so uh, one of them is in a completely different culture than the other. They, we are not going to have an efficient discussion that's going to make a constitution that is inclusive for all, for all parties and groups. And we, we think that it's important because if we have this interaction, people are going to un understand what is the issue. If uh, the issue is not just what is in your enclave as like as an Afrikaner, as someone with political and economic power, you need to see what the what the whole country is facing, and you won't be able to see that if you are if you segregate yourself from the rest of the country and from the rest of the population. And because that is also the case, you're not going to be able to understand what the what other parties in this country are going to say because you're basically living in a completely different world and you created that world for yourself um, and it was a, a choice that you made and if you keep if you keep making that choice without without the country forcing you to ex to, to leave to redistribute this power to allow people to have to have this uh, to have this interaction then we're not going to solve this issue uh, yes, I'll take your PR. Yeah, so it's unclear to me why you're going to help these people come to a better understanding of their country when you steal their land and force them to hate the South African government for taking away their sure. livelihood. How do you get to better discussions by forcing people to do things they don't want? A very simple principle. Thank you so much. Yes, so if, if like, there's an uh, there's, there's a huge importance to saying that, 
okay, if, 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 this, if you're doing the wrong thing, but you want to do it, that does not necessarily mean that you can keep continue doing it. You making the choice that you want to do a bad thing does not give you the right to do it. And that is, like, that is the whole idea of why we have laws in place. That is the whole idea of why we have fines in place. And that, like, that is the whole concept of having a government. People want to do stuff, people want to, to take actions, but that does not necessarily mean that they are true. That does not necessarily mean that they have the right to do it just simply because they, they made the choice. The second point that I want to tackle here is the importance of equity and equality in this situation. So, one, we need to provide the same opportunities to all South African citizens, and that is, like, that is what the South African government needs to uh, needs to, to aim for, and with with equality, we need to treat the, uh, all the people the same way. So, so if we if we allow, uh, if we leave the situation as it is, the rest of the South African citizens will not be able to contribute and take part in this huge economic and political state of the country. People will not be able to benefit of the, uh, from them. They will not be able to make connections with the rich people. They will not be able to get jobs and. That, that in, uh, in itself proposes an issue for uh, proposes an issue and it hurts the development of, of South Africa. And as the first speaker on my team came up and said, South Africa is a country that was built around this diversity. It was a country that was built around these these different cultures and people with different ethnic uh, different, uh, different, different ethnic and religious groups coming together and making a country that is integrated and it is for everyone. So. If we leave the situation as it is, if we do not force the people with uh, economic and political power to spread it and involve all the South African citizens in this power equally, um, then we're going to hurt the development of the country, and that is not what we want to uh, what we want to have as side government. Thank you. is that you can force Afrikaners to leave their enclaves, but you can't force them to integrate with the rest of the South African community, you can't force them to like their government, and you can't force them to start businesses and create the equity and equality that they want. Rather, when you force people at gunpoint, like open government proposes, to leave their communities that they have deep cultural ties to, we think what you do is you foment an insurrection that leads to the destruction of the kind of political progress that South Africa has seen recently. Great. A little bit of framing before getting into the speech. Recognize that we are making this decision as South Africa. As Amira told us in our great briefing, within these motions with this house as South Africa, we're taking into the interests of South Africa at heart. Therefore, I'm going to split this speech into three sections. Firstly, I'm going to talk about economics. Secondly, I'm going to talk about politics. And then thirdly, I'm going to talk about the more ethereal but principled concept of justice. Firstly, on economics, why do we think this is economically a bad decision and not in the interests of South Africa? The first thing I'd like to point out is that, as my partner said, Afrikaners own a massive amount of capital. This means they comprise a large amount of the investment that's happening in South Africa, not only in their own individual enclaves, but outside of those enclaves as well. We think the larger banks in South Africa are seeing investments from Afrikaners, for example, and the kind of businesses that are existing all throughout the country in agriculture and other sectors is coming partially from this Afrikaner capital. Why do we think then that this is a bad decision? Two, two things to say. Firstly, we think either they are going to leave out of the fear of their own government, right? So we that there's going to be capital flight of some kind. When you're forced out of your community, that doesn't mean that, like opening government said, you necessarily go and integrate into a new mixed community. You might, if you're a rich Afrikaner, just say, screw this, I'll go move to England, I'll go move to the United States of America, I have enough money, and if my government's going to hold me at gunpoint, why don't I do that? But secondly, if there's like, even if they don't leave, we say they resent their new communities and are less likely to invest in them. You're less likely to want to invest in your local community when it has forced you out by gunpoint. So we think at a very base, basic level in this debate, money is leaving South Africa and making it less prosperous. But I want to sp split this and add to something 
as the deputy leader of opposition, right? I want to say that foreign direct investment is less likely under this policy for two specific reasons. Firstly, because foreign direct investment comes through business relationships that were made with Afrikaners. I think Afrikaners are less likely to make these kinds of trade deals with foreign investing companies when they are resenting their own governments and less likely to want to invest, right? But the second thing we would say is that foreign investors are simply scared to invest in governments that expropriate property. Whenever a foreign business sees that a government is capable of taking property away from people and forcing them into other places, they say, that is a place I'm less likely to invest in because I see that that government is less likely to protect property. Therefore, we think, especially in the context of South Africa as a country that is still growing economically and is still dependent upon these foreign direct investment relationships, this isn't a good plan for South Africa to move forward economically. We think this clashes directly in comparison with the Deputy Prime Minister's point about equity and equality because we think there's not really going to be that much equity equality and equity and equality economically in South Africa when one, Afrikaners are less likely to spread their wealth because they're angry at their own government and they're angry at the new communities they've been put in. But secondly, when there's just less capital moving around that can allow people to have upward mobility and jobs. Second thing, on politics. I want to first contextualize South Africa as a healing country. That is to say, we should recognize that apartheid ended in the 1990s. It's still a quite recent memory. It's not something that happened a long, long time ago. That means the racial tensions between these kinds of groups still exist, and it's a country that is going through a healing process that is continuing to get better and better under opening opposition's perspective. Then then, Clashing with that, we'd like to say that opening government solvency can't accrue with their forcible reintegration. They want to solve these kinds of racial tensions by just forcing South Afrikaners into other communities. But why, is that, why does their own process take out their solvency? Firstly, because the, these Afrikaners are less likely to look kindly upon their own government that use military power to remove them from in areas, and I'll take you in a bit, and this means that they're less likely to, to uh, you know, cooperate politically when the South African government says, this is a new compromise we want to bring to the table. But secondly, if they want to use contact theory, efficient and, efficient and inclusive discussion doesn't exist with large-scale resentment. You're not likely to go into your new community and love all your new neighbors when you were just forced at gunpoint to move there. We don't think contact theory and integration works when you're hating your government and you're hating your new community. The way for the only way for integration and contact theory to happen, in our opinion, is for slow integration and incremental steps towards this process, not through taking guns and weapons and forcing individuals out of their communities. Go ahead, closing. Okay, why are white Afrikaners a key constituent and why is their welfare a key priority for the ends? Okay, so one, I think what the closing government is like appealing to is this idea that Afrikaners are a minority, a voting bloc in South Africa. But there's two things we would say. It's like one, even though there's a they're a minority, they still have power. You know, they still have power in the South African Parliament, even though they are a minority. They still have the ability to make compromises. But secondly, like I said on my first point, they comprise a large amount of the capital that exists in South Africa. They have the ability to invest in businesses. They have the ability to bring in foreign direct investment. We think that alone makes them a powerful ally. Right? But the last thing I want to say about politics is we want to point out that political compromise is indeed happening in South Africa. This is why Robert brings up his alternative of like land redistribution because the Afrikaners kind of have assented to certain kinds of land redistribution. Note, as Robert points out, this isn't forcible. It's buying that land at market prices and then redistributing it to black South Africans. But we think this is still a good thing, that Afrikaners are coming to the table and having these kinds of discussions. We think when you go through this policy, one, you stamp out any of that progress that had already existed. You make Afrikaners much less likely to come to these kinds of political compromises. But secondly, any kind of political reintegration that could have happened in the future is stamped. If we see that black South Africans and Afrikaners are integrating and cooperating in the political sphere at all right now, we think that's going to happen much less when they become divisive enemies in Congress because now they're actually pointing guns at each other and forcing each other out of communities. <coughs> Lastly, on justice, and I want to point this out because like, even, if, even if you buy all that argumentation, you still might say, well, there's a principled reason to take these Afrikaners out of their communities, and we think that this is good argumentation from opening government. But we think South Africa has kind of pointed out to us in its past uh, dealings that realistic justice is much better than perfect justice. This is what the Truth and Reconciliation Councils were about and why they granted amnesty to people who did terrible things. Because the idea was, like, maybe that maybe amnesty isn't perfect justice, but we have to be realistic. We are going to be an integrated and diverse community, and we need to start working towards solutions that integrate us together and not solutions that divide us. We think that this pushes back against that South African conception of justice. This principle that they have proposed is no longer about, let's compromise, let's find ways to integrate and reconcile ourselves. Now it's about, let's force you out of your communities and force you to do our bidding. We think following in the conception of justice that came through South African amnesty, we'd much rather see a situation that brings Afrikaners to the table, compromises with them, and not through force, but actually comes up with a solution together, such as land redistribution that Robert talked about. We are very, very proud to oppose in this debate.
power in South Africa since the time of Nelson Mandela, since the end of apartheid, right? And any discussion of the political will of South Africa and the political direction it will go in the foreseeable future, right, needs to involve discussion of the ANC and its priorities and its policies, right? It's been a power for the past like two decades for this foreseeable future is probably also going to stay in power. So essentially, in order to argue as the African nation, we should probably see this from the perspective of the ANC and their legislative agenda, right? So essentially, I'm going to do a couple of things here, right? I'm going to firstly give you an idea of what these enclaves look like, <coughs> what redistribution looks like, and what these impacts are going to be. And then I'm going to explain why these are going to be priorities for the ANC and for the African uh, government um, for the foreseeable future. Uh, but before that, a couple of responses to what you heard out of opening opposition, right? So the 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 Literally, the opposition goes up, right? And he, he tells you, um, he gives you this counter uh, proposition about how, like, you know, you're going to enact land reform by buying back land. Why is this harmful, and why is the ANC not going to enact something like this, right? Because, firstly, buying back land, right, essentially amounts to, like, rewarding these white Afrikaner communities for the wealth that they accrued through apartheid, right? Because recognize that the, a lot of the wealth and a lot of the land that they have accrued has come from this history of colonialism, has come from this history of apartheid and racism and oppression, right? So essentially, you're rewarding these same people, the same group of people who's oppressed your key constituents for, like, decades, for hundreds of years, and you're essentially rewarding them for the, uh, the harms that they've done, for the oppression that they've wrought, right? Secondly, uh, we think that, you know, white Afrikaners essentially, right, they, they argue, right, that they already have a, so much of the capital in South Africa. Essentially, what this policy does is that it gives them more capital, right, with which they can go and, like, further build up their base, right? They can go out, out and, like, buy more businesses, they can go out and start more companies, uh, open more factories, right, accrue even more of the capital that already exists in South Africa, which contributes to all the disparities that government brings you, right? Secondly, this idea that white Afrikaners are going to have a lot of backlash, and essentially this is going to, you know, kill like future land reform and future racial relations in the country, right? Recognize that white Afrikaners have like very little political role under the ANC structure, right? The ANC is a party, it's a party of uh, Mandela, it's a party of Zuma, it's a party for like largely the majority population of South Africa, right? Which are, you know, uh, middle class, like um, uh, South, native South Africans, as opposed to white Afrikaners, right? So, so essentially, this is not going to be a legislative priority for the ANC. They, like, you know, in the past, ANC politicians have frequently fomented anti-Afrikaner policy, like, uh, sentiments, anti-Afrikaner policies, right? We think that this history shows and demonstrates that they're not going to be too concerned with the plight of South Africans in this case, and therefore, uh, they would consider justified to use these means. Lastly, this idea about economics and political flight, how this leads to political, uh, uh, capital flight, rather, capital flight, and how this leads to reduced foreign direct investment, right? So, so essentially, um, so, so a couple of responses here, right? Capital flight can only go so far, right? You cannot take away, right? Like, if, even if you invite these people and these people decide to emigrate or, or whatnot, right? They can't take away the land, they can't take away the factories, they can't take away the business themselves, right? The actual physical capital remains in the country and can be taken up by the majority, right? And, and, and then, you know, that can be used to further the economic agenda of these communities. But moreover, regarding foreign direct investment, recognize that right now, yes, uh, Afrikaners do attract a, a significant portion of the uh, FDI that comes into South Africa, but recognize that currently, in the, in the South quote, a lot of the benefits from this FDI is accrued by this minority community, right? Essentially, you know, if we if we take back these, the control of this FDI from this community, the larger majority of the community can, can derive benefits from these investments. Moreover, South Africa has tons of natural resources. We don't think that com like countries are simply going to stop doing business with South Africa. Finally, this idea that they will resent their communities and not con contribute, right? If we break up these communities, if we force them to integrate, then essentially we're forcing them to invest in their communities. So which brings me into this idea about redistribution, right? And what this looks like. Um, so essentially, right, you know, these, these white enclaves, right, they, they're essentially, you know, communities exclusively composed of Afrikaners, right, they tend to have, like, better resources, better opportunities, better, like, economic uh, situations than a lot of the other communities, um, you know, that, that are not, the, not these exclusive enclaves, right? What does this breakup look like, right? Essentially, we would, you know, you know, you know, possibly forcibly evict these people, yes, probably, like, you know, the, at some point, evict these people, like, take away their lands, you know, force them to move into other communities, right? Uh, they probably also have the, um, they would also have, you know, presumably the option to emigrate, but essentially, you know, we would force a lot of them into, you know, to integrate into their surrounding communities, right, into other communities that are not, not these enclaves, right? So two effects of this, right? Recognize that there are two things that come out from this. Firstly, there is a push effect, right, where you're pushing these people from these enclaves into the larger, um, into the larger majority communities. This is going to 
you know, essentially, you know, do a lot of things, right? Firstly, it's going to incentivize um, business ownership and business entrepreneurial development in these majority communities that previously did not access to a lot of these resources because, you know, they, they've been denied, like, this capital for so long, right? Essentially, by moving the, this capital into these communities, you're giving the people, like, these people the ability to start new businesses in the majority com uh, communities. You're going to essentially incentivize entrepreneurship, incentivize greater employment, uh, greater um, economic and okay. educational activities in these uh, communities as well. I'll take it. So if they resent these communities, that broke them up and they move into the city and start jobs don't they just hire white south africans because they hate black south africans for taking their land away like this literally makes no sense right well you know previously that might have been possible right if they lived in a community that was composed exclusively of their afrikaner like compatriots but like when you move them into these communities where they are they don't have right th this exclusive community they're forced essentially to hire from because you know i don't think they're going to be like you know flying people in from like surrounding communities like busing people in from like surrounding communities right they're, they're essentially for economic reasons would be forced to hire from the um, their surrounding communities, and that is how you get greater employment. And that's how you get greater race relations, right? Because when you you know have these sorts of interactions, when you're no longer you know simply able to just you know have all your economic interactions be based on you know these this white offer counter relationship, uh, that's good, right? So so these are all like the the push factors, right? You also get land redist redistribution uh, because it's forcible, um, and then you get pull factors, right? So essentially, you allow. Uh, other like non Afrikaners to go into these communities that have all of these benefits, that have all of these resources, and partake in you know better infrastructure, better schools, uh, so on and so forth. You know all of these benefits in place, they get to participate in that. Why is the ANC? Why does the government support this? Right? You know, firstly for um, for political reasons, right? So, so essentially, you know, they feel that it's justified. You know, after decades of apartheid, after centuries of oppression and racism, right? They probably feel that it's justified to take away these people, right? Recognize that the ANC rhetoric frequently Afrikaners are depicted as like the oppressors, the enemies, right? They have, they have no qualms about like taking land land from these people and redistributing it to their key constituents, which are you know the majority blacks uh, in South Africa, right? But recognize, right, that. Now, uh, the, the narrative from this that is going to be hugely beneficial for the ANC because essentially, you know, with the current like corruption scandal, they can essentially say, hey, hey, look, we're like going back to our roots, we're supporting our key constituents, right? We're, we're like breaking up all of the wealth and privilege that have been accumulated for decades of apartheid, for centuries of oppression, and we're giving it back to the people that deserve it. Secondly, necessity, right? People aren't just going to like willingly give up their pr privileges, they're not going to willingly give up all the wealth that they have accrued. So, like, essentially, we don't really see a way for, the, for you to voluntarily do this without suffering significant uh, political backlash from your key. the goal 
of ensuring economic stability. And so we have to understand what opening opposition gives us to then make the extension. So opening opposition explains us that the reason why this doesn't have economic prosperity is because it kills econo uh, political co uh, capital. So they gave us three reasons why this kills political capital. First of all, they tell us that the aggression and the violence from the Afrikaners will be so severe that it is bad for other communities. Unfortunately, they fail to explain us the actual impact. It's a minority within the country, they're really rich, and we do not think that they will go on the streets. It's unlikely, so aggression is not a political impact. Second of all, they explain us that they, that they are the richest people within South Africa, and out of this reason, um, if they turn away from political um, situations, um, and supporting policies, this will actually prevent political capital. But we have to understand that politics in South Africa are not only shaped by some white people who have some money, there are also other rich forces, as the Gupta family, there are also many other investors, there is, for instance, a lot of investment by China, Point so now. they are not a singular um, impact on politics, so this is also not a relevant reason. Thirdly, they tell us that there will be an international backlash, and the only thing that give us, give us is um, the point of that Trump will somehow be angry, and that he was already angry by, for the land distribution. We do not have any mechanisms for this, so we do not understand by now how we prevent the political capital, and this is where we step in. So, first of all, we have to understand how is the government perceived that is choosing an authoritarian mean of forcing a, a part of the population out of a certain part of the country. We think, and this is our extension, the government will be perceived as extremely strict, unreliable because they do such an extreme action, and also they will create tensions. How does this work? How will they create tensions? So we have to understand that there will be several types of reactions within the communities of South Africa. So we can assume that many black South Africans will maybe perceive it as positive because they perceive it as a just act that is actually preventing or is um, um, stopping the colonization that still happens, and so they perceive it as a just act. But there's also a big part of the population that is white, that they will maybe perceive as extremely strict and not good. And so we think it will create tensions between these communities, which is impacting the governmental behavior in the future, because if we see that it creates tensions and aggressions, and also maybe criticism on the ANC, it is unlikely that they will do these kind of strict policies again. Also, we think, no thank you, and that this will lead actually to the ANC and the South African government being perceived as unreliable, because they do these super strict action, act Actually, we think economic actors will be scared away. So we see that um, if the government does not promote the well-being of one important, not the only, but one important economic force within the country, as the Afrikaners, we think this will be perceived as strict and harsh on people who are actually investing into this country. Also, we can think that investors fear that other strict actions might happen, and out of this they will not invest as much in South Africa. So the perception of the government, which we think is crucial, will be that they are quite strict, and also that they are doing tensions. We think this has a major impact on what they will do in the future if they are perceived in this way. No, thank you. And so we think this is why we can prove to you that this is something mutually exclusive and that this will lead to the problem that not other strict policies that are might more supporting the well-being of the poor communities in South Africa can happen. So we think strict authoritarian policies, as for instance the land distribution or also the enclaves, must be chosen wisely because they create a change of the perception that can prevent votes and financial support in the long term. And so it's important that we do the comparison of what kind of policy is a good choice and what is actually supporting the interest of South Africa. And so so I want to do the comparison of that. I do not th that we do not think that the enclaves are actually ensuring this, but since if we would implement them, the land distribution we can, would not happen. We think we should not do this. So, what impact does the land distribution have on the poor black communities? Right now, the countryside is often owned by white rich farmers, and if we are redistributing it to black people, of course, also black. Black people that are rich will, of course, buy them, but we think it is higher likely that also people from the poor communities then can be employed in the farms and then have the chance to work there and get more money. And so we think it is a chance for more employment of the poor black community and due to this, a chance of higher income. Also, we think it is a better chance for actually creating an impact on integration because a crucial factor that hasn't been seen in this debate is the factor of reconciliation. So we need this kind of pain relief to prevent that there are tensions between communities in South Africa. And so the notion of that white farmers are continu continuously are taking away um, the benefits of the country is creating tensions and preventing the integration between communities. And so we think 
using the land distribution as a policy will ensure that there are more people actually feeling more integrated and are having a better perception of other communities within South Africa. In comparison, we think that the enclaves do not actually support the poor communities in South Africa because if we do then open these enclaves and white people are forced to move away, most likely since the ANC is very neoliberal, they will not just give them to poor people, they will give the property to the people who can afford it and out of this reason it is unlikely that this will actually benefit the poor people in South Africa. And since also a lot of aggression and tension is assumable as opening opposition shows a sort of and we showed you more, um, we can assume that there is not a positive impact on integration but that communities will diverse more. Since we do not think that, it is that we think it is important that we ensure that economic stability is enhanced, we have to choose policies wisely. in South Africa is preserved by white South Africans holding the predominant economic power over the rest of the country. We think that given the smaller voting block, the uh, voting block of like white South Africans within like within the country, we think their political power and uh, political power rests with their hold of capital and economic power. Here, here. Gavin gave an explanation of how this this hold and stranglehold on economic capital and power is perpetuated by these enclaves, and we think these enclaves create a system or a cycle in which wealth remains in the hands of white South Africans because we think. Having exclusively what like white outlives means community resources, i.e. things like access to better education, access to better resources, are given to these white enclaves. So if we break up these white enclaves, we remove the exclusive hold, stranglehold, these like white South Africans have on economic power. Because they no longer have exclusive access to the best schools. They no longer have exclusive access to all these amazing resources. We th like Gavin gives two justifications and two uh, like beneficial effects that we think that this um, this like cycle of like breaking up the enclaves even forcibly would would, would benefit economically the system overarchingly of, of South Africa. First, we think that they would have like a push effect. They would have to create new businesses and things in other countries. Now, opening opening uh, opening opposition brings up an argument about how they would have resentment, so they're less likely to invest in these, in these communities. But we think that inherent self-interest means they have to invest in these communities. Uh, like closing opposition brought things like water shortages and lack of like good, like good schooling. If they're in these communities, things like water shortages and lack of good schooling are community problems. So if there's a water shortage in your community, you're more more likely to invest in a better water a better water system, which not only benefits you, but benefits the whole community. Also, if you don't have an exclusively white community and you create a new business, you don't have a specific, like, you are or no matter how racist you are, if you want your business to prosper, which is in their self-interest, they need to reach out and uh, like employ black, like, uh, black South Africans because they simply don't have the numbers because they no longer live in an exclusively white community. Before I go on. Okay, so but the problem is, is that starting a business isn't the only way for Afrikaners to make money. We think that the links don't work out in reality. There are rich people in Flint, Michigan. They never fix the water. Here, here. They can just drive to Johannesburg and work at a big bank there. Here, here. We think what like a benefit or, like we think a benefit of this is like first off breaking off the overarching system that allows for them to be rich in the first place i.e how do they get the capital to invest in things like banks how do they get the capital to invest in other things like that through education systems and through hold on valuable resources like land second there's a pull effect we think non-african uh, uh, like non like africanas can partake in the better resources in this communities by moving in now I'm going to go through each team in this debate and explain how like like the, the pitfalls that they fall into and how we like our argumentation like subsumes theirs. First is opening government. We think they give principal arguments about how equality is essential for the majority, but only we provide the warrant or explanation for how that equality is actualized. I.e., they, they argue that resource distribution is good, but we we give the warrant for how resource distribution actually happens by the implementation of the policy outlined in the motion. Oh. This centers around like white South African backlash to economic power and capital. 
We think the reason why they, this backlash, or they have the power to backlash, is control over capital. And we think control over capital is reinforced by these, uh, by these power dynamics. We think in the, maybe, we, maybe we would give, I'll take them at their best case. We think maybe in the interim that like there will be some like, ha- like, l- uh, like backlash in capital fund. But we think in the long term, by, bra- by giving, removing access to like exclusive access to better schools, removing access to better resources, long term, it would redistribute wealth better. On we think those uh, that's the only way to redistribute the system overall so, um, like uh, like re- 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 the system overall okay. let's let's uh, like think about why they have all this capital in the first place because of better resources better education and better jobs now I'm gonna address their counter proposition of like bu- of like buying land we think there's like three like f- like three or four reasons why this is particularly harmful first they built up this whole connection uh, to the land. So they might say no to buying the land just because of like this whole like connection to the land, which means they like link into all of like their same like uh, like off, like uh, offense that they brought up. Second, they would take that money they get from selling this capital and they would buy other like land and then they would return to these exclusive uh, like exclusively white economic zones because they would buy land create new communities um, of, of just like like separate areas you're, you're shifting the problem to a separate place third we think ethically this is just like not okay because you're rewarding them for the fruits of colonialism which is we think principally is a not a, not a good idea their whole arguments about backlash and uh, like re- we think rests on the argument that political will rests with their wealth which we will break the system of like away taking away because we think political will can be accounted in two ways first voting lots which they don't have because they're a minority and second is like is wealth which we think in the long term we remove thus removing their influence in the government so all those arguments about how like they're gonna screw like like they're gonna mess up like all these like governmental campaigns and things like that don't happen in our world in our world because we think that things like um like they would remove their political will before like closing Africanas will most likely move to other gated communities so then that money doesn't help anyone poor. Also, through breaking up the enclaves, other equally rich people will benefit from the structures. How does this help the poor communities in South Africa, which are the most important? We think that by like even if they move to gay like more gay communities, they'll have to employ not exclusively white individuals, thus I- expanding and creating new jobs for poor uh, um, non-white Africaners. Next, like uh, like the question of like foreign direct investment, as Gavin brought up, foreign direct investment, if it only benefits the rich, then like we don't think that like it that um that that is like beneficial to the country overall, especially from the perspective of South Africa. So we'll we'll bite that bullet. Next, the question of CO, like the prevents like other like other policies. We think like uh like the whole like the the things that you brought up like water shortages and community and like our community problems, which can be resolved via like our our like benefits. Next is the idea of the government being perceived as strict. First is by who is the government perceived as strict. We think domestically the majority of the country would be favorable to these policies, and the minority would lack the political will because, like, in the long run, we'd remove their uh, like monopoly of economic capital and, and like uh, like removing their political will. Thus, they couldn't mess up policy in the future. Second, other governments. We think for like we think that foreign perception of the country would not change that differently due to this policy because of the fact that we South Africa does have access to natural resources, so foreign direct investment will continue. This is empirically proven with countries like Saudi Arabia having access to natural resources and having direct investment despite the fact that the government is employing far stricter policies than this.
South Africa, there is vast economic inequality. Parts of the country are almost a developed country's um, comfort and economic level, and other parts are completely developing country, completely don't have access to the resources that do exist and that some people in the country hold up. And we think fixing this inequality, having a more fair distribution and giving it to the most vulnerable and historically oppressed people is the most important measure we need to take in this debate. And we, as closing opposition, show you how um, the government is only able to tackle some of these policies because only radical policies will do at this point. There have been some things post-apartheid. There has been the Truth and Reconciliation um, Commission that hasn't gone far enough, that hasn't been able to really fix and address everything. Not having vast economic redistribution hasn't been enough to fix the inequality that has historically built up. So now the government needs to go further. Now they need to do radical things that by the international um, community and also internally will be seen as radical. And that's why the South African government needs to be careful about it. That's why they need to be careful to not be seen as a completely authoritarian, radical state that can't be trusted with money, that can't be trusted to live in there. They need to do this carefully, but they need to do it. And what we tell you is, that they should rather choose wisely where they do it, that they should rather take things that are as effective as possible and then do one very effective policy and then mitigate the harms that will happen from it by not doing it again. By not doing this and then also doing a land reform and then also doing some other redistribution and just like establishing a pattern for everybody to see but doing one policy and saying like look we're gonna do this but then we're not gonna do it again. Then like having this policy, having this big international splash and then um, like letting it slow down and letting it be stable again. And that's why we say that the land reform is more important, that a redistribution is more important because it has such much, a stronger economic impact and a stronger symbolic impact and a stronger sense of justice too. And that's what my partner brought you. And um, I'm now gonna bring you like how that engages with all the other teams in the debate, starting with closer government, how we achieve the same impact they have, but better and more likely. Um, secondly, like how we are crucial to proving the line that's starting from opening opposition, but how only um, with us like crucial mechanisms exist. And then thirdly, how well opening government is frankly not that relevant with the impact that they want to achieve. Um, and how we are still more important than them. So starting with closing government, um, some rebuttal. They say that like the hold on the enclaves takes up resources and. Um, that the resources are exclusively there. So first of all, on this whole job point that gets thrown around, I, I'm pretty sure that the people in the enclave still already employ some black people, but in very low position. Like even during apartheid, they had like whole household staff that were black people that didn't do them much good because they didn't have, actually have access to the high class positions. They didn't have access to economic wealth. So we don't think that changes much because we let them keep the ownership of all the wealth and the resources. Also, like the access to schools and to education, secondly, like access to private schools and good schooling is still tied to money and resources. So even if you put them in a different area, the private school is still gated and still tied to money, you don't help there either. And thirdly, on the water system, like unless you're living in a township, you do have access to water, you just shouldn't take that much because there's a water shortage. And only if you're really rich, you can just pay the fines and take as much as you want to anyway or buy it somewhere else. So again, we need to fix the economic inequality and the access to resources, not the systems, because some of them are already there and it's not going to get addressed by you at all. Then like, um, they also say something like rewarding like people for colonialism by let them keeping stuff. Yeah, let them keep, not let them keep the um, economic stuff maybe, but like letting them stay in an area where they want to live. I don't think that's the most important thing to tackle here. Um, and then, yeah, like with the economic integration, again, like if people don't have money, to, that doesn't help them if there's a shop. Um, yeah, um, I think we show you that like it's more crucial to do other policies than this right now to achieve the aims that they already want because they address the economic inequality directly. What you're trying to do is to address the spatial segregation to force people together, which is unlikely to like really work and really get people to integrate because they're still going to be gated, they're still not going to share their wealth, they're still like going to live in their buildings with like lots of burglar bars and not wanting to engage. Um, what we are saying is that instead of trying to do some like social integration, which probably will not work, 
We should do economic redistribution, which is way more likely to actually give people what they need and actually let people achieve more equality. On to um, opening opposition. So opening opposition already hints on the importance of land reforms as an alternative. But the reason they pose to you is that like political capital may be lost because the Afrikaners will not support the reforms, but only my partner gives you more mechanisms and shows you um, in a more clear way like why we not get support from the Afrikaners on either side, but why the government is able to do this anyway under an ANC government, but will only be able to do one of them and why it is so crucial to choose wisely in this case. That is stuff that opening opposition doesn't give you and that is crucial to opposition's case that only we bring you. Um, they also like um, talk about the money um, that might leave and the foreign direct investment, but we again say that it's not that important that if you have like some rich people in the country, if you can't redistribute it to the people who actually need it, that it is more important to redistribute and to give it to the people in the country than whether some rich people might leave the country. And also on the foreign direct investment, like it's not only the relations of the white Afrikaners anymore, like post-apartheid there have been many relations with especially Asian investors, with like Indian investors, with Chinese investors who also have good relations with like black Africans and um, so there will still be some investment and we think we can be able to like take some hit on that because it's worth it for like different policies but this policy is probably not worth taking this hit. So on to opening government quickly, like opening government mainly talks about the benefits to the Afrikaners that are perceived from some integration, they don't really characterize them and their views towards the other people in South Africa, so they don't give us a very convincing mechanism on like how they will integrate. Um, and um, so we think that they are not the most important um, actors here anyway, even if it would in some way benefit them, they are the ones who are less vulnerable, and they are the ones who have the choice to move to a different area if they want to. So because of less vulnerability and more choice, we think they're just not as important as our actor, which is like the vast majority of poorer South, um, South Africans may need to be addressed in this debate.